Good evening. Good evening. Welcome once again to the house of the Lord. This evening, we are going to specifically be talking about Lent, the reason why we celebrate Lent, but the greater reason on why we celebrate Lent goes way beyond Lent, and it's Christ's encouragement to us, command to us, to take very seriously sin in our lives, but also to celebrate very purely His cure, His salvation. For our worship, we'll be following the common service, and we begin with our first hymn, God Loved the World So That He Gave. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful. 
to us and has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you of all of your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the feast of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, 
the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? And what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. This is the word of our God. We join now in singing together Psalm 38. take seriously sin and death so that we might rejoice in God's salvation. 1 Corinthians 10. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you, except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. 
He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This is God's Word. We continue with the verse of the day. And just a note, uh, as is tradition during the season of Lent, we'll forego the singing of the usual Alleluia after the verse of the day, which today is taken from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. This is the word of our God. And in our gospel lesson for today, which will also serve as our sermon text, we see Jesus speak of the severity of sin, but also the certainty and joy of his salvation. And I invite you to rise with the reading of the gospel. Our gospel is taken from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you not, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all of the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We join now in confessing together our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He, he suffered, suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. As we continue with our next hymn, Lord, to you I make confession.
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I'm sure you've heard about all the problems going down in Texas. And um, it's pretty tragic when you think about it. The cold weather and freezing and power going out. And then, of course, the water that follows and many people who try to stay warm in ways that they can think of dying. It's tragic. And especially tragic if you might know somebody down there. I don't know if you do. We have friends down there. We have members from the congregation who are down there. To my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, while they have experienced the cold and for a while, perhaps even the power, they haven't suffered as much as a lot. But it is pretty tragic when you see that. And you might ask yourself, why? Why weren't they prepared for this? Well, it's Texas. Who's prepared for snow and ice and cold like this? We would be because we're used to it. They weren't. And they're reaping the tragedy of it. And yet everybody dies, right? I, I don't mean to sound insensitive. And yet that's something I hear regularly. And I think, honestly, I've heard more in the last nine months than I've ever heard in my life. They all gotta die. And it's the Lord's time to take me, then he will take me. And yet I find it curious, and I've said it too, I find it curious that as people say that, at the same time, they still continue to take medication, still continue to see the doctor, still continue to practice safe things in their lives, to hold each other's hands as they walk on the ice. Why? Because we don't want to die. And we shouldn't want to die. It's a good thing to protect our lives, our lives, our gifts from God. Don't let anybody tell you it's a lack of faith to protect the life that you have. Our lives are gifts from God, both physically and spiritually. And sometimes, maybe we, we, we separate the two, saying they're very different things. They're not. We are both physical beings and spiritual beings. And just as we are, 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 are one, so those two lives are, are intertwined inseparably. Those two lives work intimately together. And God wants us to protect them both. Simply because they're gifts from him, but, but they serve one another. You know, our physical lives are tremendous expressions of our spiritual lives. I'll give you a couple of examples. Our physical lives, we sometimes refer to it as our time of grace. It's the time that we have on this earth to learn about God, to know who he is, to come to faith in who he is, and to have that faith strengthened. But it's also a time in which we share that faith, so that those who don't have that faith might come to know Jesus. It's a very important time. And it's also a time where we get to serve God in ways that we won't get to after this physical life is over. You know, we get to serve our God, but we do so by choice. We do so with other things coaching us in their direction. We won't have that in heaven. We have it here. We get the chance to be selfless here while being tugged by our selfishness to do things for other people while the whole time our mind is saying, well, what about me? We get to express our spiritual life in our physical life in so many ways. And then finally, when this physical life is over, then our spiritual life, or lack thereof, will be sealed for eternity. And so these two things are very important, and God wants us to take them very seriously which is one of the reasons we celebrate Lent. And yet, this goes way beyond Lent, but let's just focus on Lent. Why Lent? Why do we celebrate Lent? We celebrate Lent so that we might take more seriously, very seriously, the danger of sin. We do that so that we might cherish more purely, more sincerely, God's cure. And that's something that Jesus speaks about. Um, very wholeheartedly in our gospel lesson for tonight. I want to read it to you one more time. Taken from Luke chapter 13. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Because they suffered this way? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. 
But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. This is God's word. And this... This lesson came on the heels of people who came to Jesus with news, and I don't know if it was recent news or if it was something that they pulled out of history. But it wasn't that far in history because Pilate was the governor of Rome, and it was a time which, it's not fleshed out more fully in Scripture, but um, history tells us a time when there were people who were being chased, uh, being pursued by the Roman legion, by the Roman guards, and they fled to the temple. Now this had worked for people in the past. The temple is a place of sanctuary. You go to the temple, and the altar in the middle of the temple had four horns in the four corners. If you held onto the horns of the altar, you had sanctuary. And they did that. And often the Romans respected the traditions of the Jewish people, but not this time. Pilate said, go and get them. And so the Romans marched into the temple. And they slaughtered those people at the altar and poured their blood in the altar. And it was brutal. And one of the questions that was raised is, is uh, were they so bad that this happened? They must have been terrible people. Well, the fact of it is, they probably were criminals. They were very likely zealots. And, and zealots were people who were very misguided, who thought that it was God's design for them to rebel against the Roman government. But it was not. They wanted to overthrow the Roman government because they thought it was, this was God's will. God had never commanded this. He had not even suggested it. He told them to obey the authorities that were placed over them. And very likely they didn't. And that is why they were pursued the way they were. But Jesus makes the point, were they worse than the other people in, in town? No. Were these zealots, these rebels against the Roman government, were they worse than the greedy tax collectors? No. Were they worse than the sexually immoral, the prostitutes in town? No. Were their sin more, more, more egregious than the arrogance of the Pharisees? No. In God's eyes, sin is sin, and it's all worthy of death. Jesus is making the point, these people didn't experience this because they were such terrible sinners. They died. And that is something that happens to everybody. So you... Be careful. Because you too will die. And if you do not repent while you have this time of grace, then you will perish too. Make it a point. He, he goes on. He says, or those people who died in the Tower of Siloam fell. This is another one we don't know that much about. It was a tower that was in Jerusalem, and apparently this tower, the, the bricks, this, this collapsed and killed 18 people. Were they, were they sinners? Is that why this got allowed this to happen? No. We don't know if they had any specific sin, but they were no worse, no better than anybody else in Jerusalem. And yet this tragedy happened. And, and Jesus points it out and he says, this, is, this, this happens. You can expect in this life to die. And that's not a good thing. But if you're not ready for it, then you will not just die physically, you will die spiritually. And so Jesus tells them to be ready, to, to be prepared for that moment. Of death. How are you prepared? How are we prepared for death? We're prepared by holding on to Jesus. Jesus tells us, whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. But make no mistake, death is not a good thing. Death is a curse. Death is a curse by God and it remains a curse. It's not something to look forward to. It's not something to usher on. And yet, we know that connected to Christ, there is beauty on the other side. <clears throat> Christ didn't make a friend of death for us. He just promised that we will survive it. But we will only survive it if we recognize the seriousness of our sin and because of this, to cherish God's cure. It's called repentance. That's why he says, repent. Repent, otherwise this will happen to you too. 
When we talk about faith, we're saved by faith, right? It's the same thing. Faith is recognizing our need, our dire need for forgiveness, and then cherishing the fact that God has given it. There's a beautiful passage in Scripture of somebody who went through this, who explains it to us, and there lies King David. Psalm 32, he says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. When I kept silent, not willing to acknowledge his sin, my bones wasted away from my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sap was in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. How important it is to be able to recognize that sin is, is a continuous danger in our lives, physically and spiritually. And if we let it control us, if we, we, if we own it, then when death comes, we are separated from God eternally. That's, that's the constant pull of sin, which is why Jesus so vehemently and so regularly says, be prepared. Be ready. Be ready for that day. Why aren't people? You know, this is something for us to take seriously. Like so many things, we just shouldn't just say, well, those people weren't ready. Some people aren't ready. Are we? I have no doubt that right now we are. I thank God for this. But it's a, it's a, it's a constant thing for us to continue to be prepared. I think about a passage in Hebrews where Jesus speaks of this through the writer to the Hebrews. In chapter 3, he says, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold on to our original convictions firmly to the very end. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Pointing back to what we read about. Hold on to that conviction. Why is that hard? Why is it hard to remain prepared? It's a very simple reason. Because there's a lot of noise in life. There's a lot of things that, that demand our attention, our, our preparedness. And the, and the simple rule, simple but accurate rule, is the squeaky wheel generally gets the grease. Whatever is pulling us most in life is, is where we give our attention. And so we may be prepared for many things. Our children may be prepared uh, to bring about a, a reversal in wrestling. And they might be prepared to shoot a three. They might be prepared to hit a curveball or even off the tee. They might be prepared for a math test. We might prepare ourselves for the weekend. We might prepare ourselves for a big project. We might prepare ourselves, if we're forward thinking, for our retirement. We prepare ourselves for a lot of things that are crying to us daily. But often God doesn't make that kind of noise. He doesn't scream and say, pay attention to me. He speaks. He points out dangers in our lives, the dangers of sin, and he encourages us to come and listen to his forgiveness. But he doesn't scream. He simply hopes and prays that we listen. And you can see the importance of it in Jesus. Where he tells, tells his disciples, you see these tragic events in life, but recognize that you need to be prepared. Because one day you will die too. Be prepared. And in order to make that point even more clear, he gives this parable. The parable of this vineyard where, where a, a person has this great vineyard and there's this one fig tree that he keeps looking to every day for, for fruit. And for three years he hasn't found any fruit, so he says, cut it down. But the worker says, give me one more year. I will work with it. I will, I will feed it. I will fertilize it one more year. Give me one more year to, to work with this so that it might be what you want it to be. And if it isn't, then, then cut it down. And I hope you can see Jesus' heart in this. And sometimes so many people, and God forbid it's us, but, but the danger is always there. That we aren't who God wants us to be. That we don't have that faith. That we don't have that trust. That we don't hold on to him so long enough. Because the sad truth of it is, we don't care as much about ourselves as God does. And sometimes it's, it, it, it's, it's dangerous. Sometimes we slip. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we don't pay attention. The difference between us and that tree is that we get to bring that food to ourselves. That's the sad truth. We don't always care. We don't always take it seriously. The beautiful truth of it is the same, though. Jesus does care. He does care more about it than we do, which is why he keeps speaking, which is why he came to this earth 
to take away the curse of sin, to take away the punishment of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the curse of death. And he asks this rhetorical question, where is your sting death? The power of sin is, is the law. The power of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He took the blame for sin. He took the punishment of the law. And it's why death, even though it is still an enemy, is something we will survive. If we trust. He came to this world to give his life so that we wouldn't have to die and now he says in Romans chapter 8, he stands at the right hand of God waiting for that moment when we will stand before God so that he can say, they have every right to be here. I took away the one thing that keeps them out. He says those, that, that to those who, are, who have faith. And so in addition to that, between that time when he died on the cross, between that time when we stand before God's throne, he promises his spirit who will speak who will remind us, who will point out the, ta the danger of sin, who will point out the pain, but daily remind us of the joy of forgiveness. Christ loves us and cares more about us than we do. But I pray that we can fill that gap. We can care just a little bit more, take it a little bit more seriously, and when we realize what is at stake, we will. We'll take seriously where we stand with God and rejoice in our salvation. That's what Lent is about. Taking these things seriously, embracing what it is we have. But I pray it goes way beyond Lent. But let's take it 40 days at a time. Let's take the next 40 days. Consider this. Hold on to what we have. And after Lent's over, we'll take another 40. You and I, together, we'll hold on to this. We'll hold on to that conviction that we have. We'll be prepared. We'll avoid that tragedy together with Christ. That's his will. I pray it's always ours. Amen. And now may that peace of God which transcends all human understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Once again, please rise. As we join in singing together, create in me. so quickly, so successfully, we ask that you now heal him, give him strength, return him home, be with Marty as well during this difficult time, and hold him close, as you hold us close, until that day we live with you in glory. We ask this all in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with our next hymn, Wondrous Are Your Ways, O God. Glory be to Jesus. Thank you. 
evening, and uh, before this evening, we all go our separate ways. Uh, it's been a joy worshiping with you today, as always, and I pray that God's peace rest upon you until we worship Him together again.